Hi, everyone. My name is Evan Veration, and I am the coordinator of the Clarence School District Family Support Center. Uh, and tonight we're going to be hosting uh, the first of a series of four events focused on supporting our, our little learners, uh, which is definitely a parenting series, but for anybody who might be a school staff member or anyone really who has young children in their life that um, they might support or uh, take care of in different capacities, uh, we wanted to make sure that we had some opportunities, um, especially getting into summer when routines are a little bit disrupted and when structure is not quite as in place as it is during the school year, um, for parents to get some information, get some education, um, and really provide some opportunities uh, for them to feel a little bit more comfortable um, in situations that sometimes can be challenging. Uh, so our Family Support Center in Clarence, um, and there's some districts uh, elsewhere in Western New York that also have Family Support Centers, but ours in Clarence is located uh, at the high school campus. And we're able to provide uh, direct support as well as uh, we provide a lot of school-based support, getting into classrooms and educating students and staff on different uh, topics around mental health and, and just overall wellness. Um, but we also uh, usually at least once or twice a month try to provide some education for the community uh, around different topics that might be relevant to families and students and just community members at large. Um, so tonight we have uh, Dr. Greg Fabiano with us, and I'll let Greg kind of introduce himself in a second. Um, but Greg and I have had the chance to uh, build a relationship over the past year, and he's just a phenomenal resource in the community. Um, so he's with Florida International University. Um, but has spent uh, time at the University of Buffalo and just really is um, a vast kind of well of, of knowledge and um, has done a lot of research around different areas of child development. Um, so for all of those who might be watching uh, live, thank you for showing up. And then we are going to post this on our uh, district YouTube channel, as well as our website, which I can share later. Um, so anybody that wants to watch at their own leisure, feel free. Um, and without further ado, Greg, take it away. Thanks for that nice introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here. I am a professor of psychology at Florida International University, which is located in Miami, but we have a satellite campus office uh, located in Amherst, New York. And our mission is to do research and other related projects that will support families who are trying to raise kids to be the best they can be. We often work with kids with challenging behaviors, but we also work with uh, typical child development as well. I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about some everyday parenting strategies that can be helpful in supporting uh, little kids up until teenagers. Uh, I'll leave it up to you to think about how you're going to adapt these tools for your own use to fit with your own parenting values and your own family system. Uh, but they're, all the things I'm going to talk about today are research informed. There have been studies that have shown that these are effective ways to help kids uh, feel safe and secure, um, do what they're supposed to be doing, and ultimately learn and grow. The parents make a huge contribution to child development. There's a, a huge uh, body of research that's shown that uh, for, uh, particularly positive parenting practices and uh, low levels of coercive or negative or uh, harsh parenting practices um, promote healthy child and adolescent development. That being said, anybody that's been a parent knows that their kids are to some degree uh, wired to do things that make the parent frustrated, cranky, upset, irritated, and uh, to some degree, those behaviors start right when they're born, right? A child starts crying and being upset and fussy because they need us as parents to help them, right? They, they're hungry, they're, they need a change of clothes, they need uh, other things, they're cold or they're too hot. Then that crying and that um, kind of complaining behavior elicits an adult helpful response. As kids get older, however, when they're three or four or five or 16, that crying or cranky behavior maybe isn't uh, as necessary, as urgent in, in terms of eliciting adult help. And sometimes it causes problems. And so I'm gonna tell you about a model of uh, problematic parent-child relationships that uh, has been studied for a long time. And I'm gonna show you a little video about how you can create this problematic parent-child relationship in under three minutes in my own living room. 
what happens is if kids do things that are sassy or non-compliant, or maybe they dig in their heels and they're oppositional, that puts parents on their heels, right? They have to react to this negative child behavior. And sometimes they might react to it well. They might uh, uh, use a set of parenting tools that they've decided they're gonna use in that situation. But other times they may react poorly, right? They might lose their temper with the child and yell at them or maybe um, they were having a bad day already and this just tipped them over the edge. And so for a mild misbehavior, they've now sent the child to the room for the rest of the night. Other times the child might do something negative and the parent doesn't do anything at all. They ignore it or they let it go. If there's this sense of inconsistent parenting where there's sometimes overly harsh responses and then other times lax or uh, um, ignoring responses to uh, misbehavior, that sends mixed messages to the kids. And their best uh, uh, processing of those mixed messages is that, well, I guess I'll just have to do that sort of uh, misbehavior again in the future. It seemed like it worked. I did it long enough and my parent backed off or gave in, or I did it and nothing bad happened um, a few times ago, even though I got punished this time. I know in the past it didn't result in a punishment. So I'll try it again and maybe I'll try it for a little longer or a little more intense. And so that ups the ante on the kid's side, which then causes parents to have to up the ante on their side. And over time, what can happen is the parent-child relationship can become fractured and, um, and based on this revolving door of negative interactions. The kid does something negative, the parent responds negatively, the kid does another thing negatively, the parent has to respond negatively to that. And that's the theory behind a, a lot of the misbehavior we see with kids. But talking about theory is nowhere near as good as showing you about theory. So I'm going to show you a little video here. Uh, we were doing a study a few years ago in um, preschool settings where we were uh, working with male caregivers and uh, encouraging their involvement in the preschool setting by uh, doing an after school sports program. And just to set the scene for what we're, uh, I'm going to show you here, we would have the, uh, the men do sports skill drills with their kids. And, um, because they were, we were evaluating how well it was working, we would take some videotapes of them before the program started, and we would take some videotapes afterward to see if they had improved in their parenting approach after going through our program. And we had uh, college students watch the videos and note how many times the parents said nice things or how many times the kids listened and how many times the parents kind of scolded or yelled at their kid. And I was creating some training videos for these college students to watch before they watch the real videos. And so one of the videos, I was a real positive, enthusiastic parent. I was rah, rah, I'm really proud of you. You're doing a great job type of uh, feedback that the child was getting. And one, I just kind of folded my arms and watched. I was a neutral parent. And this last video was the video that was supposed to be the more coercive or negative parent, the one like that figure I just showed you where uh, maybe they were coming down a little too tough on the kid when they were misbehaving or, or not doing quite the right thing. And I had my daughter volunteer to be the kid for these videos. And uh, I'm going to ask you to just watch this and then I'll get your feedback on what you see. Go ahead, Mary. Go around, go around. Do you know what I mean? Oops, sorry, we're buffering. Go around, go around. Do you know what I mean? Go around. I know, Daddy, but... Go, 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 go. Go, go, go. That's it. That's it. Don't hit the cone. Hold on. Come back here. Go around it. Daddy, that's why you're supposed to move it like back. Okay, okay try it again. Back from back there. Go around. Okay, now go back to this one, all the way over here. Go around this one over here. Quick, quick, quick. Whoa. Be careful, don't knock it backwards like that. Keep it going forward. No hands. No hands. Daddy. Didn't I just say don't use your hands? Now come on, go around this way. Come on, go around this way. Just do it this way. No! No! Come on, we gotta finish this up. No! Come on. No! Go around the cones over here. No! Just like this. 
I'm gonna shoot it. Come on, stop pouting. Come on over here. I'm not. Just stop pouting. Come on. I'm not. Well, that sounds like pouting. Come here. No. Try one more time. No. Come on. No. Come on, Mayor. We got two more cones to go around. Come on over here and do it. No. Come on. Come on, just try no. real quick. One time, just one time all the way around. No. Boo. Would anybody like to offer um, what they saw that maybe was going wrong with that example? Post it in the chat or you can unmute yourself. It's pretty bad. There's a lot of the uh, kind of the same directives without really getting a different response. Repeated commands, almost in staccato fashion, over and over and over and over again, but not really noticing or listening that the child was having a little bit of difficulty with this task to start with. Anybody hear any praise for the good effort or the start? I'm an optimist about kids. I never think a child ever shows up to a classroom or a sports team or uh, dinner time or, or anywhere expecting to fail. Kids show up for every activity expecting for it to go well. And, and I think we saw that in this video. She was trying her best. When I've shown this video to occupational therapists, they really go nuts. They say, um, no, no, this is really bad. Look at those cones are too close to the furniture. This is completely developmentally inappropriate. You did a terrible job even setting up that situation for your child. Of course, she couldn't do it. And um, I don't know if anybody, uh, I, something I'm embarrassed about uh, with this video uh, myself is, did anybody notice what my first intervention was when she didn't listen? The first thing is apparent, my, my first instinct. I didn't do any reflection about my own behavior. I didn't really think about uh, actively listening to what she was trying to say. I just picked her up and tried to put her back on the middle of the cones and, and try to get her to do what I wanted her to do. And uh, that wasn't scripted or tantrum wasn't scripted. Uh, this was, um, I think, a really great example of how this coercive process can be uh, formed. And even just under two minutes with a child who doesn't typically have uh, these kinds of behaviors. I should mention no child was harmed in the filming of that video. Uh, we had a bowl of ice cream afterwards. We made up. She's played soccer since. I didn't uh, ruin her soccer career. Um, but I, show, I like to show that video because uh, that's just two minutes or three minutes. Now let's think about an entire day a child might have, right? From the second we're asking them to wake up and get out of bed and all of the commands, demands, uh, requests that we put on them to get ready for school, put on your clothes, brush your teeth, eat your breakfast, get your backpack, put your lunch in your backpack, put your shoes on, tie your shoes, get your coat, where's your coat, get your hat, where's your hat, uh, we're gonna be late. And if you think about those, uh, all those things just in the maybe 20 minutes in the morning and then you extrapolate outwards to a bus driver and a teacher and an after school program worker and a coach and another caregiver and maybe an older sibling and all of the things that the child's being asked to do, if we're not real tight as the uh, adults in our approach to parenting that child, um, we can see really quickly and easily how maybe they, things can start to go astray and we might see some of the tantruming or the oppositional behavior or the challenging behavior that we sometimes see in families. And I'll, I'll just pause there before I start talking about any particular uh, strategies that parents can use. Does anybody have any questions or follow up about that? Maybe everybody's really saving their good questions for the end. That's fine. 
I'll, uh, we'll, we'll chat uh, after we talk about these strategies. So uh, think about the role of a parent. They do all of these things, right? They're a mentor, they're a guide, they're a child's biggest supporter. Some of the research literature about parenting just talks about availability, that you're just there if you're needed, right? That it's important that there's someone that can be called if a child gets sick while they're at school or um, a co-parent availability might be really important. That There may be a parent who does a lot of the everyday tasks related to parenting, but it's really helpful if they have another caregiver that they can rely on if they get sick themselves or if they have a, um, something that they have to do with a sibling. Discipline and, uh, is also a big part of parenting, and discipline isn't always what people think about in terms of the negative parenting. Discipline is also the positive parenting as well, and in fact, uh, I would argue that um, dis discipline in terms of uh, privilege removal <clears throat> or time out or other consequences uh, will never work if it's not done within the context of a really warm, supportive, uh, encouraging, engaging parent-child relationship. Otherwise, your time out is your same as your time in, and why bother trying hard if you're the, from the point of view of the kid? And so one of the first things that's really important to acknowledge is if any parenting approach is gonna work, it has to be uh, within the context of that really positive, warm relationship. Uh, where do we um, think about uh, dealing with kid behavior? If uh, you're there yourself and you're thinking about working with your own child, or maybe you're a caregiver for a child, uh, maybe you're a teacher. Uh, there are lots of settings where kids can uh, really go either way, do the right thing or maybe get into trouble because they don't make the best choice. That includes their classroom, their bus, uh, includes the grocery store, the supermarket. In fact, if anybody's interested in uh, being kind of more, more of an um, observer of child behavior, I encourage you to go to the toy section in a um, department store and uh, you'll see all sorts of behaviors present, excited behaviors, uh, crying behaviors, um, appropriate behaviors, inappropriate behaviors, all of those sorts of things. And the way that we often think about addressing behaviors in, that kids exhibit is really in two ways. There's two ways that you can do it. You can monitor, modify the antecedents of behavior. So these are the things that come first. These are things like setting rules and expectations. Um, we'll talk about structuring situations. We can also talk about planning ahead. And then the other way you can modify behavior is by consequences. This is uh, catching a kid being good, uh, using rewards, uh, using prudent uh, negative consequences if misbehavior happens. And uh, so we think about them as A, antecedents lead to B, the behaviors, followed by C, the consequences, A, B, C. And when we work with kids with challenging behaviors, oftentimes parents or teachers will say, I don't know why they're doing this. We've talked about it a hundred times and they continue to do the same thing. And that's a time where as adults, we have to think about from the child's point of view, putting ourselves in their shoes, why would that behavior make sense for them? Maybe there's an antecedent that we're not thinking about. Maybe there's a consequence that's working for them right now in that moment that is more important to them than the downstream consequences of getting in trouble with their parent or teacher, for example. And so when we talk about these tools that follow, I encourage you to think about how you might use them as either antecedents or consequences to help the child be the best that they can be, to set them up for success. Because if we have the child behaving well and succeeding and thriving, well, now as the adults and as parents, we're on the high ground, right? We can praise them and compliment them and, and we're happy with what they're doing. If the child is struggling and doing things that are causing us to use a lot of more negative consequences, we're on the lower ground, right? We're reacting. We're having to deal with something that is unpleasant both for us and the child. And oftentimes, if we think ahead about how to modify antecedents, then we don't have to get to these consequences that are more negative. So what can we do? Antecedents include structuring situations. So uh, when I go into classrooms, I work with a, in, the, in the community with a lot of really outstanding educators. I always appreciate the thoughtfulness that goes into how they set up their classroom. You often don't, you don't see the children's desks all just pushed willy nilly all around the room. They're often in groups uh, where the students know they're working together with their classmates. Sometimes they're in rows so that the children have their own space to work in. Um, when we structure situations, this also um, goes back to, um, some, I was just coming from a parent uh, child group uh, we make the kids, uh, they, when they arrive, they can play with all the balls and all those sorts of things. We learn this lesson the hard way. We, before we start anything on our day, 
we make the kids put all the balls back in the equipment bag and we collect all those and put them away because we'll never get the attention of the whole group if there's still some fun rec equipment uh, out able uh, to be played with. Clarifying expectations and contingencies is another antecedent. So I see this when I'm out in the community at the grocery store. Occasionally I'll see a parent take a knee right in front of the door of the supermarket and I'll see them say something like, today's not a day where you're allowed to get a treat in the checkout line. What a great bit of parenting right there, right? They're telling, giving that child a clear expectation about what's gonna happen. It doesn't mean that the child might uh, uh, still ask for something in that checkout line because that candy's put there for a reason, right? The supermarkets are smart. They put it right at eye level so the kids see it while the parent is stuck between two carts and has nowhere to escape. But if you, as a parent, clarify that expectation ahead of time, you might not get as big of an ask as you're used to, or you might not have as frustrated of a child. Rules are a really important antecedent. <clears throat> so uh, if anybody's ever been to a public swimming pool, you will see rules posted, right? No diving in the shallow end, no horseplay, no gum, shower before swimming. Those are there because they did studies a long time ago, it's almost a hundred years ago, where they found out that if they simply put that sign up, the majority of people will follow what those rules are. If we have anybody on this call that typically drives on the 290, you know that there's a rule posted, right? 55 miles an hour. Now that means you can probably go about 62 without getting a speed limit. If you live in the area long enough, you know there's a little wiggle room, but you also know if you're going more than 65 on that stretch of road you're, and you're breaking that rule, you're likely to have a consequence. So they post that so that you know that that's the rule. And then we'll talk a little bit about commands and re behavioral requests that we give to kids. I'm gonna to return to that in a moment. That's maybe one of our most important antecedents that we as adults and as parents can change. And then we'll also spend just a little bit of time today talking about uh, consequences. Praise and attending, catching a child being good is free. It costs us nothing as an adult. And yet it's one of the least used parenting or educational tools out there. Uh, when they've gone into classrooms and looked at rates of praise in classrooms, you get a pretty good level around kindergarten. It drops off, but it's still okay in first grade. And then by second grade on, the rates of praise relative to commands, demands, reprimands, behavioral requests, corrective feedback is really, really low. And so that's one place, if, if you take anything away from this talk today, it would be find a few extra times to catch your child being good. Notice them doing the right thing. Don't let sleeping dogs lie. Actually point out when they're doing the right thing and give them the attention for that. And maybe they won't try to grab the attention uh, by another method uh, later on. We'll talk about some other consequences as well in a moment. Any, uh, I'll pause there, any questions so far? So rules, routines, and predictability are incredibly important. They're important for little kids, our preschoolers and our um, primary grade students, but they're also important for adolescents as well. I don't know if we have anybody on the call today that's parenting an adolescent. But rules, routines, and predictability is really important when we get up to that age as well, when there's really a push for more independence. Rules can be uh, straightforward for particular situations or settings. So sometimes families have dinner time rules, like the expectation is you'll be home for dinner, uh, or uh, you have to use good table manners. I expect you to use utensils to eat when we're eating. And uh, 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 Rules can also be specific to particular contexts. So we do a lot of work with um, adolescent drivers with ADHD and rules are really important for that. So a family might have a rule like you have to put your cell phone in, uh, locked in the uh, glove box before you turn on the car. And you're not allowed to have more than one friend with you in the car at any uh, particular time. Even if there are other friends that need a ride, a family rule is that you can only have one. Uh, Structuring activities can be really important. And we're gonna talk about pre-MAC contingencies when then in a minute, that can be really helpful for homework and uh, getting kids to do things that they really drag their feet about doing. And then families should provide feedback about rule following and rule breaking and review the rules frequently. So a lot of times, the classic uh, parent instruction is be good or behave. That almost always means something different from the point of view of the parent than from the lens the child is looking through. And so reviewing specifically what the rules are, we're going over to your cousin's house. You are not allowed to ask me for anything like a sleepover or staying later or extra time in front of your cousins or your aunt, because that puts me in an awkward situation. 
If you want to ask me anything, the rule is you have to take me aside and we'll talk about it together before we make any decisions, right? That's an example of a, a time limited rule for a particular situation. Praise is the simplest thing we can do. If a family has more than one child, balanced attending is really important. And if you don't believe me, all you have to do is tonight, start talking uh, to one of the uh, children and giving them lots of compliments. And I'll guarantee you'll have an interruption very shortly from the other kid trying to get your attention to, uh, to get you to direct that positive attention to them. So that's an important thing to consider. Sometimes you might have to work one-on-one -on -one with a child during homework, or sometimes you might be working with them to organize their room, or, or maybe you're in the yard working uh, on some uh, fundamentals of a sport that they're trying to get better at. Uh, if that's going on, be mindful as a, of a parent that the other kids are, are conscious of the fact that this attention is now directed 100% to someone else and not them. And a good strategy parents can use is just to make sure to attend to that other kid intermittently. So if I'm doing homework with a child and we're spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to do this long division and it's, uh, I'm really encouraging them to persist and get it done. And I have another child in the room, maybe independently reading, I would throw in once in a while, hey, I really appreciate how you're getting your reading done. Looks like you're doing a really good job making a lot of progress on that chapter. Uh, thanks for letting me uh, work on this long division. I'm, I can't wait to hear what you have to tell me about that story in just a moment. And that balanced attending can head off at the past some of the interruptions that parents deal with. Now, <clears throat> planned ignoring is another strategy parents can use. Now, this should never be used for serious behaviors. You wouldn't uh, plan to ignore aggression or um, insubordination or, or cursing or swearing or um, something that is uh, uh, a big deal in families. But planned ignoring is a great strategy to use for minor inappropriate behaviors that really don't move the needle in terms of being negative. So examples would be things like fidgety or restless behavior. Um, some minor bickering between siblings, uh, sometimes a, a little bit of a complaint, like the classic example would be like a kid rolling their eyes that it's time to do homework, but they're taking out their book to start their homework. Instead of saying, don't roll your eyes at me, I might say, or don't roll your eyes around homework. I might say, glad to see you getting started, right? Attend to the positive behavior instead of the negative behavior. And uh, interrupting behavior is another one that often happens in families. And a, a strategy of parent, uh, um, uh, a parent um, researcher suggested a long time ago uh, was if you're constantly getting interrupted on the phone or talking to other adults, you could have someone call you up on a fake phone call and you could practice uh, differentially attending to non-interruptive behavior. So I might have my friend call me and say, oh, thanks for the call. Oh yes, I understand this is very important, a very important call. You have all my attention, uh, just one second. Hey, this is an important call. I really appreciate you letting me talk to this person and uh, not interrupting. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. I see. I see. Oh boy, that sounds really serious. Oh, oh, just one second. Hey, thanks for letting me get this call wrapped up. I'll be with you in just a second. And uh, and then you go through and finish the call, and then you could praise the child afterwards for not pay, not interrupting. Uh, over time, if you use that sort of strategy of differentially attending to the not interrupting behavior, you give the child what they were looking for with their interruption, right? Their consequence was adult attention, but you're giving it to them for doing the appropriate behavior, being patient and teaching them a skill that's gonna help them through their whole life, right? Nobody likes to be interrupted. Uh, here's, a, here's an example of the opposite of that. This is what I, talk, uh, this is what I was talking about at the beginning. Uh, you know, kids, as soon as a parent starts to do anything that might not involve 100% attention to them, will start crying or complaining or arguing with a brother or sister or uh, doing things that demand the adult attention. And uh, in this example, they're describing this as parent behavior modification, right? That's ex essentially what they're doing. They're getting the parent to uh, respond to them uh, through, the, through the negative behavior. So I talked, I talked about catching kids being good praise. That's by far the most important thing we can do as parents is give the attention to the appropriate behavior we want to see more of that's going to foster more appropriate behavior in the future. But there's also been a lot of research on the instructions or behavioral requests or commands that adults give. And, uh, and they actually did this research a long time ago. This was in the 1970s. And they would invite parents of four-year-olds to come into a research laboratory. And they would have them play with a lot of really fun toys. And then at the end, they would say, okay, 
playtime's over, now have your uh, child clean up. And they would have the uh, parents do their best to get their child to clean up all the toys. And they were behind a one-way window watching what was happening. And one of the interesting things was, is that they noticed that parents gave all kinds of behavioral requests during cleanup tasks. But uh, some of the requests that they gave were only listened to by the child and resulted in compliance um, less than 50% of the time. They were really ineffective. And then they saw that some parents gave behavioral requests that the child listened to over 90% of the time. These were really effective behavioral requests. And if I ask you to reflect on your own parenting, or if you're an educator, your own teaching, think about just the first 20 minutes of the day, how many behavioral requests you issue to that child. When you think about it, a child's whole day is people telling them what to do and they're supposed to do it. And if you could uh, uh, go back to that video I showed you where I was giving all those commands right away in a row and not giving the child any chance to comply, I was just creating more non-compliance, which resulted in more commands, which resulted in more non-compliance, which was a frustrating situation for both me as the adult and for the child. So when we think about effective requests, they are not these things. So the ones where we're shouting from the other room, come to the dinner table, it's time for dinner. And we don't know if the child is even paying attention or even heard it. Those are poor requests. Take out your math book, turn to page 32. Uh, take out a piece of paper, write your name at the top, write the date. You're going to do the odd number items. When you're done, put the worksheet in the blue bin in the back of the classroom. That would be a, a too many steps, right? How many of you can remember all of those things right now, let alone somebody who's eight or nine years old? Uh, the commands we grew up with were, are not good requests. Behave, pay attention, knock it off, cut it out, stop, be good. Those are too vague for most kids to understand exactly what they're supposed to do. Uh, polite society usually gives commands as a question. Do you mind passing me the salt? Would you like to get started? Do you think we should stop right here? Those are fine and polite society, but for most kids, they're a huge problem. Does anyone want to say why? Then I'll say it. They imply a choice, right? That, no, I don't feel like stopping right now. I would like to stay up for another two or three hours. Or, no, I don't think it's time to get started on my homework. In fact, if you ask me, I think we should never start. Uh, anytime you have a question mark at the end of a behavioral request, you are implying a choice. And that's almost always not the intent of the person issuing the request. Let's commands are uh, for, because let's is a contraction for let us. So if I say, let's get going, getting ready for bed, a child might be thinking, okay, I'll wait till you're going to get going too, right? Most times, I mean, for the child to start getting ready for bedtime. And then com uh, commands that parents give, I'm, I'm guilty of this myself, uh, stop talking for the rest of the day, right? That's a bad command, right? There's no way that that's going to be something a child can do, nor something I can evaluate. So good commands are the opposite of these things. They're issued once attention's obtained. Um, with little kids, I might even tip up their chin, make sure they're looking at me, making eye contact. Um, with, uh, with older kids, I might put their name in front of the command first. So I orient them that I'm gonna be talking to them about something. I give commands one step at a time. They're behaviorally specific. So rather than say behave, I might say something like, um, sit in this chair with your hands in your lap. That tells them what to do instead of a vague one. Uh, I um, issue them as declarative sentences, not questions. I you use clear phrasing. And then uh, you should have consequences for both compliance and non-compliance. And the best uh, evidence in the whole field suggests that you should give one command and then wait 10 seconds for the child to comply. And people say, yeah, I do that all the time. But let's actually think about that. If I say, um, put your homework back in your backpack in 10 seconds starting now, it's not 10 seconds, still not 10 seconds. That's not 10 seconds, not 10 seconds, 10 seconds. Think about all that time in 10 seconds that the child needs, right? I don't want to do that right now. They got to have that thought first, right? And put it to the side. Then they have to think, okay, but I have to do it. And then they have to think about where is my backpack? And then they have to think about where is that work? And then they have to turn all those thoughts and keep them in their working memory long enough to turn it into a motor behavior. And then they have to uh, execute that motor behavior and go get their work. And then they have to go put it in that backpack. 
If I'm saying, put that in your backpack. Come on, let's go. Come on, let's wrap this up. Get that in your backpack. Go, come on. Why, are you, why aren't you doing it yet? Get that work away. Don't forget your work. If I'm doing that all in rapid fashion, all I'm doing is interfering with that uh, working memory and probably making the child frustrated and not doing what they're supposed to do. And there's a question. Go right ahead. You might have to you unmute your microphone. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. I'm I'm using my phone. Hopefully, you can hear me. Okay. I can. Yeah. Um. So my question is, I'm Jamie. Hi. Um. What is a suitable uh, consequence? I struggle with that a lot. Um. You know, I have three boys. My oldest is eight and he has ADHD. I'm a single mom. And so <clears throat> when um, I, I guess, threaten with a like, well, if you don't do this, I'm, you're going to go to timeout. And I've, you know, struggled with timeout. I've struggled with taking away things. I've tr struggled with like, what is a, I guess, a suitable consequence to, to their behavior when um, they don't comply with like what I'm asking them to do? It's a great question. Uh, the first the first thing we should start with is what happens if they do do what you ask them to do that should okay. always be followed by praise attention uh, mm -hmm. adult attention is the coin of the realm right it is the best thing in the world for a kid and uh, right. what what often happens and if um, most parents their typical approach is that once the kid listens they're relieved and they move on to the next thing they probably have to figure out because parenting is hard work it's really busy uh, and all that gets the attention is the non-compliance because that's frustrating to the parent, right? You didn't do it. I said, now I, this is inefficient for me. I already told you to do that. I thought it was done. And now I got to attend to this again. And now we got to deal with this. And there's more things that we got to deal with later. And we haven't even finished this first step, right? So the first thing to think about is praising for compliance. Every time a child follows through, noticing it, even a little tap on the back. Uh, I appreciate you listening the first time. That was great. Uh, glad that you got that wrapped up. Um, if a child is repeatedly non-compliant, so you give an instruction, you wait your 10 seconds, a uh, typical consequence should be to give them one more chance. Uh, uh, say, okay, this is the second time, go put your homework away in your backpack. And then if they don't listen the second time, then an immediate consequence is usually uh, the best thing to do. That could be a timeout, it could be privilege removal, it could be some sort of, um, uh, you know, brief, for really little kids like preschoolers, a timeout doesn't have to be sitting in a chair or sitting on the step. It could just be that you take away your attention. You turn and do something else and you don't attend to them for a minute or two. And then you come back and say, I asked you to put this away. We can't move on until you put this away. Put that toy back on the shelf. And then you continue that chain of events until it gets done. And in the beginning, it's really hard work, right? Because we would expect if I, if we, that coercive process is working, that the child's gonna say, well, I don't like this new sheriff in town. I, I like the old way where I could get away with things once in a while. And they might push back, right? And they might not do it. They might get, sometimes kids will get a little nasty or talk back. But if you decide as a parent to hold the line and not um, uh, start to pay attention to the negative behavior and all that, and just work your plan, over time, mm -hmm. kids will start to take the path of lesser resistance. And we'll talk a little bit more okay. about timeout in a moment. Um, another strategy parents can do to reduce non-compliance is to give fewer commands, to choose your battles, to start to think about uh, what am I willing to go to bat for and see all the way through to the end versus mm -hmm. what is something that I'm not willing to go to bat for, in which case maybe I'm giving too many instructions and so my child's getting overloaded with all of them and they're just shutting down. Mm -hmm. yep. Was that, Thank you. did that answer your question or? Um, yeah. Yeah, very much so. Um, I do want to ask real quickly about um, ignoring. So, um, and if that's effective. So I have an eight-year-old, a six-year-old, and I have a three-year-old that's almost four. And a lot of times um, the three-year-old especially does a lot of like throwing and hitting and, and turning over furniture. And oftentimes being alone, being a single parent, <clears throat> I usually can't necessarily focus my attention on him. So um, I will often like turn my back and just pretend like I, I don't see it and not pay close attention to it. But I'm not sure if that's an effective 
thing to do or like it's hard to have my focus on him while the other two are doing something so I just thought to rather than focus my attention on that negative behavior I'm trying to like make it look like it's it's not a big deal I'm I'm not paying attention to you now I'm focusing on the other two that are behaving and I don't know if that is really something that's effective or not yeah, I guess um, one qualifier I should say is it's going to be hard to, uh, Rome was a built in a day, so it's going to be hard to come up with a solution for lots of things in a talk like this. I, I would say happy to chat with you offline if you want, my contact information will be at the end here. And I know the Family uh, Center of Clarence is excellent. I, I would refer you first to them and, um, yeah. uh, and talk with them. Um, one thing, one comment I will make is that it's really hard to deal with challenging behaviors when the challenging behaviors are happening. Uh, it's, it's kind of like the um, the old Mary Poppins that uh, uh, ninety percent of it is the preparation, right? That uh, well begun is half done. If you so, if you know that you can expect some challenging behaviors. You want to have a plan ahead of time of, first of all, how to talk with a child about what's going to happen if these challenging behaviors happen. So they know when they're calm, what, what's going to be happening when they're not having as many good uh, cognitive resources at their disposal. <laughs> but the other thing is a parent, then you know what to do and you've already decided what your approach is going to be because parents aren't at their best when they're uh, in an emotional situation with a child misbehaving. I, we've all had the situation of um, maybe getting in an argument with somebody and an hour later, we're driving home and we think, oh, I know what I should have said that would have really zapped them. Yeah. You don't mm -hmm. come up with that good idea until right. your emotions have calmed down and you can use the more analytical part of your mind. So good parenting really happens at the preparation phase when before the challenging behaviors happen. And then when they're happening, hopefully you're just working a plan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Another, uh, and, and I'm conscious of the time, I'm going to introduce a couple more um, topics. I'm happy to chat for as long as people like about uh, any questions or um, situations they wanted to talk about. Um, a really good strategy for parents, I think we said in the flower, we talk about homework time, uh, are what are called pre-MAC contingencies, or sometimes it's called grandma's rule. And this is a really simple strategy. This means that you put the less preferable activity before the more preferable activity. They're often called when-thens. When you eat your vegetables, then you can have dessert. When you put away the blocks, then you can take out your cars. When you do your homework, then you can go outside. When you work for two weeks, then you get your paycheck, right? It's the same uh, principle that we all work with in our jobs. The pre-med contingencies, for, so I work with a lot of kids who have challenging behaviors or attention uh, challenges. And parents often are having a hard time with homework with kids that have attention challenges. And so when we talk about how homework works, um, it's, it's sad sometimes. Parents dread it all day, right? They're thinking, I don't even wanna go home and have to sit and try to get this homework done with my eight-year-old. And I'm sure the eight-year-old feels the same way. And so sometimes when we talk about how homework goes, the parent describes their schedule as well. Um, she comes home and she needs to unwind and she has a snack and then I let her play for a little while outside and then of course it's dinner time and then she has to take a, a, a shower and then it's seven o'clock and this homework isn't done and it goes all night. Well, that's the opposite of the when then contingency, right? Everything that happened that whole day is better than homework and the only thing at the end is homework. Um, followed by bedtime, which might be the only thing worse than homework in that child's whole schedule is having to go to bed because that's boring. So one way to flip that around is for uh, parents to say, you have to do your homework as soon as you get home from school. And you have an hour, the parent has to figure out what would be a reasonable amount of time. You have an hour to do your homework or an hour and a half or whatever it would be. And I'm gonna set the timer and I'm gonna check your homework to make sure you didn't rush through it and you did it right. And any time that's left over is your free time. If you wanna go on a screen or you wanna go outside or you wanna uh, do an activity with me or you wanna do something else fun, any of the leftover time is all yours. And that immediately sets up a pre mac contingency for the child where they're motivated to get their homework done and done well because the faster and more efficiently they get it done, the more time they have to do that thing that they're begging the parent to do all the rest of the time during the day. And now they're in charge, right? It's not the parent's job to decide, can I be on the iPad or can I turn on the TV or not? The child is in charge. 
when I get my homework done, then I can watch a television program or then I can go on a screen. And for many families that completely turns the homework battle around because now it's not, there's nothing to fight about. You've laid out to them a pretty good scenario where they can get what they want if they do what they're supposed to do first. And then the last thing I'll just mention briefly is time out there. For most kids, they're gonna make mistakes. They're gonna do things that get them in trouble. Timeout is actually short for timeout from positive reinforcement. So this goes back to what I said at the beginning. If it's a really negative parent-child relationship and the child's always in trouble, we wouldn't expect a punishment to work. If the child didn't understand what the limits were and what the rules are and what the expectations were and they were getting into uh, punished for all of a sudden for something they didn't even know that they did wrong or that was wrong, we would expect it to not work. In fact, the best timeout or punishment systems are working when we almost never have to implement them, right? The reason why speeding tickets work and most people don't speed grossly over the speed limit on the highway is because the consequence is bad enough that we don't wanna to have to give up $250 or pay more car insurance or be late to where we're going because we got pulled over. Uh, timeout and punishment works the same way. It has to be timeout from positive reinforcement. Most kids would be rewarded to be timed out from homework, right? Great, please send me to my room as long as I don't have to do this algebra right now. Uh, uh, in those cases, timeout would work if we postponed it. If we said, okay, you're misbehaving right now during homework or an activity you don't like, you're going to owe me 10 minutes later during something that you do like. Um, if some families privilege removal works better that we, you say that, okay, for today, you're not allowed to have your bicycle or maybe uh, a screen that you like to go on. Uh, it's also the case that more and longer durations, uh, evidence shows that that's not the answer. When parents tell me, yeah, I took away his, uh, his uh, video games for the whole summer, that's usually not an effective strategy. That's way too long. And now the parent has taken away the one motivator that maybe they have to help the child do what they are supposed to do each and every day. Uh, what the evidence shows for timeout is after about five minutes, longer times don't add anything to it. And it, it's good enough to have the child sit out for that brief time. Let me end there. I. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. If anybody disagrees with anything I said or has any of their own tools that they use themselves that they might wanna share, this is a good forum for that as well. And uh, I wanna thank everybody for the time and attention. And also thanks for the good questions. Thank you. Uh, if no one else has any questions for uh, Dr. Fabiano, uh, I have a couple that work. Sure, sure. Um, so there was one question that uh, came from our registration and that would be what are the best school accommodations? And this is a little bit not exactly on topic, but um, what are the best school accommodations for our students with, a, with attention challenges? This is an area that we're really interested in our own work. Uh, there's many accommodations that are used for kids with ADHD or attention challenges, things like getting extra time on assignments, preferential seating. Um, there are other uh, sorts of um, accommodations that kids sometimes get like breaks when they're working. Um, it's an interesting area because there's not been a whole lot of research at all on whether or not these accommodations work. And let's take extra time on an assignment for an example. If a child has attention problems and they haven't been paying attention to that assignment for a half an hour, there's no logic at all to giving them another 15 minutes to just not pay attention longer, right? And in fact, that's the most common accommodation that schools use for kids with ADHD. We did some research that showed that actually that didn't work. That made kids work slower and they did less work when they had a long amount of time uh, because their, most of their attention uh, was dedicated to the first 15 to 20 minutes. And then we saw it tailing off, which is almost the definition of um, having an attention challenge, right? So a better approach might be something like chunking up work into smaller bits and saying, uh, I'm going to give you this one worksheet should take about five minutes. I'm going to set a timer. Let's finish it in these five minutes. And then I'll give you a five minute break and we can talk or do something else. And then you can come back and do the next worksheet or the next thing that we're going to do. 
You could also use that premax system, like um, I suggested earlier, to try to get the child to work more efficiently and more quickly in a smaller amount of time when we know their attention is stronger, as opposed to uh, my heart goes out to the parents doing homework for three or four hours with kids. There's no way that that can be a situation where any learning's happening, right? All it is is frustration and, and conflict. Uh, even if you get it done, it's not suiting the purpose of homework, which is just supposed to reinforce what you already know. Um, other accommodations might have some merit, like uh, I appreciate the educators that allow kids to stand at their desks or move around a little bit, not get on top of them for fidgety or restless behavior. Our job in educational systems isn't to teach kids how to sit with their bottom in, on chairs. Our job is to teach them how to read and write and be good citizens and get along with others. And so that's a good example of choosing battles. And so the last thing I would say about that is a lot of the accommodations focus on the symptoms of ADHD, attention or fidgety or restless behavior. And I think that's misguided. I think that we should be focusing on the impairment caused by ADHD. Uh, is there a problem with learning? Is there a problem in small groups uh, working and getting along with other kids? Is there difficulty in persisting with the tasks that the teacher is asking you to do? And our accommodations should address those things because ultimately that's going to be what helps the child be successful in school. Any other questions? Um, so, Greg, I just want to thank you for coming on. I want to thank those who came on today, uh, gave up some time. Uh, many of you, I, I'm sure, as we discussed, have little kids running around at home and uh, need to attend to them. Um, so I want to thank Dr. Fabiano for coming on um, and providing some time, as well as you guys providing some time. Again, this will be posted on the Clarence School District's uh, YouTube page. Um, you can also, so you can find those on the Clarence School District YouTube, YouTube page. Um, in the chat, I'm gonna put our uh, website, which you can also find um, videos, uh, including this one, but also other presentations that our office has put out uh, this year. Uh, you can also find podcasts that we've put out uh, with different uh, experts in areas um, like Dr. Fabiano. Um, and I can also share the podcast that he was on. Uh, if you want to hear Dr. Fabiano expand on uh, some areas like ADHD and, and some of the areas of his research. So uh, feel free to check those out. We have other videos around other um, more mental health topics as well, um, as well as some substance use topics. Uh, and, you know, we have three other uh, parts of this four part series that are going to be going on over the month of May. Uh, Dr. Fabiano is going to join us again the 18th i think so the 18th and um best self behavioral health is going to be putting on uh two others that are focused on um kind of parent-child interaction therapy and just really how to support our young learners so if you're interested in that um you can reach out to me uh at fsc at clarenceschools.org and i can help you get registered for that as well Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody.